Amen. So keep your place here in Luke chapter 16. So in Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19, uh, we see the story that we're going to look at this morning. So here we see a story, and I specifically say story because this is not a parable. Okay, this is not a parable. A parable is a comparison. You know, see, you'll see words like, you know, like as unto. You know, you'll see things like it's, you know, it's like a metaphor that a story is being used. But this is actually a story. And in verse number 19, you'll see there was. It starts out saying there was. So this is something that happened. Okay, this is a story that happened. This morning, um, I want to talk to you about the title of the sermon this morning is, you know, what if there was no hell? Okay, so we don't hear, one of, hell is one of these things um, that we don't hear a lot about today, that if you go to um, churches around the country today, you're not going to hear a lot about hell. As a matter of fact, if you're a soul winner, you'll know that there's a lot of people that claim to be Christians that don't even believe in hell. Okay, so I want to talk to you about hell um, this morning. We see a story of a man that went to hell in the Bible. Now, these are, are red words. If you have a red letter Bible, this is actually Jesus telling this story. So the Bible talks a lot about hell. Hell is another one of those things, you know, we're a King James only church, but hell is another one of those things where if you don't have a King James Bible, you're going to be very confused on hell. There's a lot of crazy false doctrine from new Bible versions that come out of, you know, um, the doctrine of hell because they change the word to Hades and they teach these weird doctrines like there's a half hell that Christians will go to for a while. You know, it's, it's similar to the, the heresy of purgatory. Okay, look, it's not in the Bible. There's heaven and there's hell, which is what the Bible is talking about in Luke chapter 16. Let's look at a few verses on hell, and then we're going to do a thought experiment this morning. We're going to do a thought experiment, and because, look, everything in the Bible makes sense. Okay, everything that is taught in the Bible will make sense to you. And today we have this idea that hell is mean, that hell is, you know, judgmental. And hell is, so that's why, you know, people don't talk about it. That's why you'll get these feel-good preachers up there that are talking about just nothing but good things. I'm going to show you this morning how that preacher is actually the mean one. Okay, we're going to do a thought experiment this morning on what things would be like if there was no hell. Right? That's, that's what churches teach now. So let's look at what things would actually be like if there was no hell. First, let's do a little Bible study on what the Bible says about hell. Turn to Mark chapter 9, and I'm going to read for you Matthew 10 and verse 28. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, you're going to go to Mark chapter 9, but Jesus says in Mark 10, or Matthew 10, verse 28, he says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather feel... Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the, body, the Bible here is saying, Jesus is here saying that, you know, your soul will be destroyed in hell, not just your body. Okay, look at Mark chapter 9, look at verse 43. The Bible says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Of course, in Luke chapter 16, you know, we see in verse number 22 of Luke chapter 16 of the story that we just looked at, um, the Bible says, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's heaven, folks. It's not some weird, you know, different place that certain people go to. It's just talking about heaven, paradise, heaven, same thing. The rich man also died and was buried. And in right away, by the way, there's no soul sleep. Okay, right away, Lazarus was carried to heaven. Right away, he woke up and he was in hell. As soon as he lifted up his eyes, he was in torment. He lift up his eyes, being in torment. He's, being, he's in pain. He's suffering immediately. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. <coughs> he could see Lazarus in heaven, and Abraham could see him. Look at Revelation chapter 20. In verse number 14. Actually, you just turn to Isaiah 14. I'll read for you Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Very popular soul winning verse that we talk about um, out giving the gospel to people. The Bible says, In death and hell, we passed into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That leads me to my next point I'm going to get at. The Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So hell, at some point, will be cast into the lake of fire. So the question is, where is hell? Where's hell located? Turn to Isaiah 14 
in verse number 12, or verse number 15, I'm sorry. Isaiah 14 and verse number 15. Because the Bible tells us where hell is. It's a physical place. It's an actual place that is going to be at some point taken and all the people that were in it are going to be put into this place called the lake of fire. Okay, so the lake of fire and hell are, you know, the, the concept is the same, but right now hell is not in the lake of fire. It will be one day. Okay, look at Isaiah 14 and look at verse number 15. Let's look at where hell is. The Bible says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So here we see that, you know, the Bible says that hell, you know, if you go to hell from where you are now, you're going down. Okay, it's a, it's a location, it's a direction, you're going down to the sides of the pit. This is also very interesting, okay, because Revelation 9, 2, and Revelation 20, verse number 3, call it the bottomless pit. Okay, so they say that it's this pit that it has sides, but it doesn't have a bottom. So what does that mean? Go to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 9. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And look at verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 9, the Bible says, let's start up in, in verse number 8, actually. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, this is talking about Jesus, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now look at verse number 9. In parentheses here it says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? This is talking about when Jesus ascended into heaven. But the Bible says he descended first into what? The lower parts of the earth. Now, we, of course, no, I just preached a whole sermon on this in Acts chapter 2, that when Jesus died on the cross, his soul, the Bible says, actually went to hell. His soul was in hell, and that's what the Bible is saying here, is that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth, it calls it here. So, where is hell? Hell is this place of torment, is this place that the rich man in Luke chapter 16 went, Hell is down. Hell is a, a bottomless pit. It, the pit has sides. It's in the lowest part of the earth, the Bible says. Well, what's the shape of the earth? Okay, it's not flat, just to let you know, okay? The earth is not flat. I didn't even know that was a thing until like three years ago. Until I, it, I did not know the flat earth thing was a thing until I moved to California. But it's a real thing out there, folks. I mean, it's, it's like crazy town. People actually think the earth is flat. It's actually like a pancake, they say, right? But anyway, we're not getting into that. The point is, the earth is round, okay? The earth is round. If you go down and you go to the lowest part of any round structure, where are you at? You're at the center. You're at the center. So hell, the Bible is telling us that hell is at the center of the earth. And it makes sense because, you know, you think about a bottomless pit, you think about something that has sides. Just take a basketball. I should have brought a ball up here. Take a basketball and just like turn it around and swirl it around. There's no bottom to that thing, but it, all there is is sides. All there is is sides. The Bible is teaching us that hell's a physical, actual place in the center of the earth. At some point, at some point, that place will be moved to the lake of fire. Okay, but right now, that's where hell is. Go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and look at verse number 15. Luke chapter 10, look at verse number 15. Look, the Bible tells us where hell is. It makes all kinds of sense when you look at it. It's a bottomless pit. It has sides. Look at verse number 15. It says, And thou Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven. So here's this city that's all, they think that they're just great, and they think that they're just very heavenly. He says, No, thou shalt be thrust down to hell. Again, showing us that hell is down from where a city would be on the surface of the earth. Hell is in the center of the earth. It's very simple. Okay, turn to Matthew chapter 25. Okay, so hell's in the center of the earth. We see in Luke chapter 16, this rich man, he went to hell. So how long does it last? How long is he going to be there? That's the next question. I mean, how bad is it? I mean, he's in torments. How long is this guy going to be in torments? I mean, how much time does he have to put in there? I mean, that's, isn't, don't we have a prison mentality in the United States? You know, you do a certain amount of time. How long does it last? Look at Matthew 25 and verse 46. The Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that, you know, you go to hell or whatever their place is called and you just burn up. You know, you're just, you're just destroyed. Okay, some people believe you just go in the ground and you just, you go nowhere. But the Bible says you go to hell. This man went to hell. How long does it last? 
Look at Matthew 25, verse 46. The Bible, say, the Bible says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. It kind of makes sense. If you think about, you know, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved, that we have everlasting life. Hell's the opposite of that. You have everlasting punishment. When's it end? It doesn't end. It doesn't end. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 48, which I read you one of the verses. Into that, in those sets of verses, Jesus says, the fire that shall never be quenched. He says it five times. Whenever the Bible repeats something, you should pay attention. You know, when it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse number 8 and verse number 9, that whosoever teaches a, fall, you know, a, a gospel other than what we've given to you, you know, they shall be accursed. He says they'll be accursed in both verses. That's how, that's how serious God takes the gospel. Jesus says that hell is eternal in, Matthew, or in Mark chapter 9 five times in a row. Five times. Do you think he's trying to, you know, I mean, the thing, I'll, I'll mention this out soul winning to people, but here's the thing. You know, another thing, people, you know, churches today, these liberal churches, they're not teaching about hell. They're not talking about hell at all. That's why you'll see Christians that, that don't even believe in hell. Because nobody's talking about it. Why would they believe it? They don't read their Bible. Right. If they read their Bible, it's some fake Bible that doesn't even talk about hell. So nobody tells them about it. You know, nobody's talking about it. But here's the thing. You know, the Bible, I mean, it's real. It's real. It's, it's there. I will talk to people out. It's the same reason that they change who Jesus is, these same liberal churches. They talk about, you know, this Jesus that is that just like, oh, it's just love everybody, never judge anybody, all this, you know, he's just, you know, he's the sheep Jesus. He's carrying the sheep and the cane. He's just walking around. He's a long-haired hippie wearing a dress. And he's just this super nice guy. Look, Jesus, Jesus talked about hell ten times more than he talked about heaven. That's the truth. That's the truth of the Bible. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 48, he says hell's everlasting five times. Is that sheep Jesus? Jesus is just like hell, hell, everlasting punishment. He's like, cut your hands off if it's keeping you from being saved. He's, why, why does he talk about Jesus so much? Because he's some big jerk? No, because he doesn't want people going there. People will get that too. You tell people that Jesus talked about hell ten times more than he talked about heaven, you say, why do you think that is? They'll be like, oh, he was probably warning people. People will tell you that. People will say that to you. He, he doesn't want you to go there. Would a loving God not tell you about hell? It makes no sense. Look at Jude chapter 1 and verse number 6. Look at Jude chapter 1 and verse number 6. Jude 1, 6, the, the sixth verse of Jude, right before the book of Revelation, Look at Jude, and look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in what? Everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Look, folks, it is torment. It is you're going to be chained up in the dark being tormented for eternity. It's the most, it's literally the most horrible thing you could ever think of. This, this, this hell that the Bible is teaching about again, that Jesus is talking about again and again and again. Most of the verses that I just read you are read in your red letter Bible. It's Jesus talking about this. It's Jesus telling us about hell. So, but no one talks about hell. But no one wants to talk about hell. Churches don't want to discuss it. You go out, you go out soul winning, you will meet people that hell is actually a stumbling block for them to get saved. How many times have you heard people say, well, I just don't believe in a God that would send people to hell. That just sounds cruel. That just sounds mean. I just don't believe in a God. Look, they're not thinking it through. And that's what I'm going to show you this morning. We're going to do a thought experiment this morning. We're going we're gonna to do a, what's a thought experiment? We're just going to, we're going to just pretend. We're going to do a Bible study on the idea that there's no hell. Okay, we're going to suspend that. We're gonna, I mean, we know the Bible says that there's hell. Okay, we're going to suspend that for a second. And we're just going to look at what things would be like if there was no hell. And you will quickly be able to realize that 
Hell is a merciful thing that God has done. It's fair. Because we think in our lives, you know, I don't know if you saw Pastor Anderson's sermon from the Red Hot Preaching Conference. You should listen to it. We think in our lives like, not fair. Like, no, no, no. What you think is fair, if it doesn't match up with the Bible, is false. You read the Bible, and when you read the Bible, hopefully when you leave here today, when you read the Bible and you come across something in the Bible that goes against the culture that you were brought up in, you accept the culture of the Bible. You cancel your culture with this culture, because this is the truth, my friends. But the, here's the irony of these churches that never talk about hell. These people that go to these churches that never talk about hell, they don't even know if they're going to go there. They go to some church that doesn't tell them if they're going to go to heaven. They have no idea if they're going to go to heaven. And they don't know if they're going. You know what they're doing? They're just playing the odds. <laughs> so what, what are the odds? You know what? Jesus tells us that too. What do you guys, I mean, are, you know, that's why most people that go to churches like this, look, if you are a soul winner, you will, you will have your pulse on, the, on what people believe like nobody else. That's why most people today in America think that most people are going to heaven. Because, like, hell is just not something they hear about. It's not something that they, they know about. Look at Luke chapter 13. Most people, most people today that go to a liberal church, they think that most all people are going to go to heaven. And it makes sense because if, you know, they all, you know, I guess they'll, they'll think that like some people are going to hell like Hitler. Hitler's in hell for sure. And some serial killer that they've heard of or something. That guy's in hell. There's like four people in hell to the American Christian today. But what is, Jesus actually answered this question. Look at Luke chapter 13. Look at Luke chapter 13. Actually, you turn to Matthew 7. You turn to Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to read for you Luke chapter 13, because this was, this was explained by Jesus in two places in the Gospels. Then one of them, you go into Matthew 7, 13. In Luke 13, 23, the Bible says, then, one, then said one unto him, one of the disciples, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Jesus answers to him. He says, he, the, the disciple walks up to Jesus and, and asks Jesus this, this question that everyone has wrong today. They go up and they ask Jesus, Lord, are most people going to heaven or, just, or, or is it a majority or a minority of the people that are going to heaven? And look what Jesus says. He says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I will say to you, will seek to enter in. It shall not be able. Look at Matthew chapter 7. He gives a little bit more detail where I had you turn. Look what he says. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate. This isn't the straight as an arrow. This isn't S str a-I-G-H-T. This is S-T-R-A-I-T. A straight. What it means is like a, a narrow passageway. Like the, the, the Persian Gulf has the, the Strait of Hormuz, if you've ever heard about it. It's this narrow passageway to get from the Persian Gulf out to the, the Gulf of uh, Oman, I think it is, into the Indian, Indian Ocean. But it's this, it's this big gulf, and it goes into this narrow passageway. That's a straight. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, for wide is the gate, the opposite. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Look, this is another reason you've got to have a King James Bible. Because in many of the new Bible versions, most of them, I believe, it says, straight is the gate and difficult is the way. Is the way to salvation difficult? Is it difficult to, to receive a free gift? No. See, they're changing the gospel in these new Bible versions. It's not just these random little words. You know, it's, they are changing the, the gospel. Pastor Burson's had a great sermon on the, the NIV and some of the major errors in the NIV. You should also listen to that um, sermon as well. Listen to them all, but um, just it, it applies here. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. He, he's saying that, that it's going to be the few that go to heaven. It's not hard. The Bible compares salvation to eating a piece of bread. The Bible compares salvation to walking through a door. Look, it's man's pride that the reason that few will be saved. Jesus isn't happy to report this. He's not like, yay, few people are going to be saved. That's just the way it is. And if you, and if you are out there sowing, you will know that the vast majority of people are unsaved. 
the vast majority of people think that they're going to get themselves to heaven. And they're going to be broad, that's the broad way to destruction. Okay, look, most people are going to hell. It doesn't make me, it doesn't make me happy to report that to you, but when you see these liberal churches, they're out there and they're teaching people exactly the opposite. When these people come out of these churches saying, oh, most people are going to heaven. God would never judge anybody. God would never throw anybody in hell. You know, they're being taught a false God. They're being taught a false Jesus. And, I mean, these churches are sending people straight to hell. Is that, is that nice? Is that good? No. So let's look at this. Let's look at this this morning. Let's do a thought experiment on if there was no hell. Okay, so let's just, aside from the Bible not being true, I mean, that would be a problem, but let's just put aside these verses that talk about hell, and let's just look at the logical, just the logical reasoning. What would things look like if there was no hell? I'm going to show you some things that would not be able to exist if there was no hell. Turn to Psalm chapter 89. Right in the center of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalm. Just Psalm chapter 89. Psalm chapter 89. The first thing is this. The first thing is this. If there was no hell, and I'll show you these things from the Bible. If there was no hell, there would be no justice. If there was no hell. Look at Psalm chapter 89. Look at verse number 14. Psalm chapter 89, verse number 14. Look what the Bible says. It says, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Notice how justice goes. Now you turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Just one book over, Proverbs chapter 21. Notice how in Psalm chapter 89 and verse number 14, we see that justice, it goes with judgment. They're together. And it doesn't say justice or ju judgment. It says justice and judgment. They're like, a, they're like a married couple going together. They're together. Justice and judgment, which, which is what? Hell is judgment. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. So the first thing that you wouldn't have if there was no hell is there would be no justice. There would be no justice. Look at Proverbs 21, verse number 3. The Bible says, to do justice, what? Oh, here it is again. And judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Justice and judgment go together. There cannot be one without the other. Another false, uh, you got to listen to Pastor Mejia's sermon now from the Red Hot Preaching Conference, but another false doctrine being taught in all these churches that ironically don't teach hell is that you are not to judge, right. is that no one is to judge. You know what judgment is? Judgment, see, see, just because people today in our society redefine words, we always have to define words from what the Bible tells us. Judgment isn't like, eh, I think I'm better than you. That's what people think judgment is today. Just like, ah, I think I'm better than you, and I just think I'm better than everybody. Everyone's like, oh, that person's really judgmental. No, judgment is discerning good from evil. That's what judgment means. God literally ruled the nation of Israel using judges. They governed the nation. We studied through the entire book in this church on Wednesday nights. Do you think that when, when people came to the judges, they just went, eh, I'm better than you? No, they judged situations. They discerned good from evil. If you go to a judge today, I'm not saying they're good, but that's what they're attempting to do is judge right from wrong. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Are you there? The Bible says, judge not. I mean, this is another one that's misquoted all over the place. You know, don't judge. Don't ever judge. No, the Bible says in Matthew 7 verse number 1, it says, judge not but let's keep reading. Let's not just read two words. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. Now let's keep reading even further. For, what with, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with that measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And it says, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? You know what the Bible is saying here? Let's continue reading through the whole thing. Or how will thou say to thy brother, let me pull the mote out of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in my own eye. A mote is, like is like a sliver, a little piece. And a beam is like a big railroad tie in your eye. And then it says, thou hypocrite. And then look what it says. It says, 
first. It doesn't say, don't ever judge. It says, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and shalt thou clearly see to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. It doesn't say that your brother doesn't have anything wrong. This is a guy who's a drunk going up to somebody who went out on Friday night and drank alcohol, being like, you shouldn't drink alcohol as he sits there drinking. This is what this is talking about. It's, saying, it's not saying don't ever judge. It's saying don't be a hypocrite. It's saying fix your own. And you know what? You'll find this with people. You'll find this with people. People have massive problems, massive sin in their life, and they're going to tell, and they're going to tell people how to fix their own sin. It's like, no, no, no. Fix your sin first. And look, that, that's motivation as, uh, that's motivation to be in a Bible preaching church that just sits here and rips your face off about all the sin in your life. So you can get your sin out of your life. Because why? Why? If you have sin in your life, are you not saved? Are you unsaved all of a sudden? No. Your salvation is going nowhere. Your life, your Christian life, and building your Christian life according to the Bible is all about how you will profit other people. And the Bible here is saying, hey, you want to be a prophet to your brother? Get the beam out of your eye, man. Get the sin out of your life. Get the sin out of your life, and then you can help your brother with his moat. It's not saying, like, don't ever judge anything. Th that would be the craziest thing in the world. Look, that's what we're being told today. That's what we're being told. There, everything's, everything's okay. There's no shame. There's no bad. There's no good. There's no evil. That's what we're being told today. It's, you see, it's an agenda, folks. It's an agenda. It's all coming from the same thing. It's all getting you to, be, to stop discerning evil. And that's why they don't talk about hell. But the point I'm trying to get at here is, like, back to the original point, without judgment, there can be no justice. Who would you walk up to today that would say justice is a bad thing? But without judgment, you can't have justice. Would you like to live in a world with no justice? Think about that. Would you like to live in Fresno with no justice? Think of the examples we see today. Just people running wild. I mean, someone commits... Someone commit, just let's look at some examples. Somebody just commits evil. You know, somebody just goes and just is murdering innocent people. And there's just no judgment. How, how's that going to go for a society? Un, just unfettered murder. How about this one? Abortion is a perfect example of this. Completely legal, completely accepted by society, completely, and 60 million people died. 60 million people. There is no equivalent to that num those numbers of murder in the Bible anywhere. All the wicked kings, Manasseh that sacrificed, you know, children to false gods, all these things, there's, no there's nothing near what we've already done in this country in the last 50 years. But why? Because there's no judgment. Meaning, there's no justice. Think about theft in California. This is a small example. Just think about it, like, there's no... There's no judgment. Like you get in no trouble. There's no consequences for stealing something. It's like every single time, like not every time, but like my wife will tell me of, of instances every week where she sees people just stealing things. Where she's out grocery shopping or maybe going to buy a, a shirt for the kids or something. Just people just like, it's just open. It's just right there. They just walk in and take things. Why? Because there's no judgment, so there's no justice. That, that's the way it goes. Turn to Judges chapter 21. Judges <laughs> chapter 21 and verse number 25. There was a, I, I read a, a couple months ago about like a, there was like a camp or an outpost like north or, or like northeast of LA somewhere. And it was like this, you know, anarchist paradise or whatever. And some reporter went in there for just, I mean, went in there for just a, a day or two and they had to leave. But they're just like, it's just a cesspool. Like, they're, they, you know, this anarchist paradise where there's no rules and no law. They're like, there's just like assaults going on of all different types. They're like, it's ter there's drugs just everywhere, disease everywhere. You know, there you go. There's, there's no judgment. There's no justice either. Look at Judges chapter 21 and verse number 25. Look, there's a reason that we read through Judges. You know, you see the story of Jephthah in Judges chapter 11, who sacrifices his own daughter. He kills his own daughter. We see the story of the Levite and the concubine in Judges chapter 19, which is probably the most horrifying story in the Bible. 
This woman who is just horribly assaulted until she's dead by these just wicked, you know, sodomites and just these horrible, wicked people. But look at Judges chapter 21 and verse number 25. How could that, how could that happen? How could a society get to that point? Look at Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. The Bible tells us, we can kind of see, like, when you read through those things in the Bible, many people will be disturbed by things like that that they read in the Old Testament. You have to remember that stories in the Bible is not like what God agrees with. We're just reading stories. God's just telling you, look, this is what these people did. You know, I mean, all these terrible stories you read about in the Bible, people will, will read that and they'll be like, oh, look, everything that man did in the Bible is, is not good. There's, there's history in the Bible. There's a reason it's there. Okay, look at Judges chapter 21, verse 25. The Bible gives us the answer of why we just read through all these messed up situations. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And what? Every man did just that was right in his own eyes. There was no judgment. Every man was just doing whatever he thought was right. I was talking to um, the kids, you know, the other day, and I was just talking about, you know, one thing you have to recognize about, about bad people, one thing you have to recognize about bad people, about people that do evil things, is that, you know, they're not, they're not evil, they're not bad, because they have a tail and horns and like a forked tongue. They're bad because of the things that they do. Many bad people, many bad people think that they're good. You'll see Christians doing bad things. They think they're good, though. Why? They just don't know what the Bible says. They're not following the Bible. They're just doing what? They're doing what's right in their own eyes. They're not esteeming others. So when you get somebody who's walking through their life, and they're just crushing people around them, just doing horrible things to people around them, it's very possible that they think that they're doing the right thing in their own eyes. You know, maybe they're blinded by pride or, or whatever other sin is in their life. But that's what makes somebody a, a bad person, just doing what's right in their own eyes. So the point I'm trying to get at, back to point number one, if there's no hell, if there's no judgment, there's no justice. Yeah. And we see plenty of those examples of how no justice goes in the Bible. Okay, so no hell, no justice. How about this one? There's no hell, there's no mercy. Ooh. How would you like that, there, to live in a world where there's no mercy? You say, what do you mean, no mercy? Did you know, and this is from, this is from a, a, I think it's higher than this, but I'm just quoting a scientific website here, from livescience.com. And you think about this. Look, if you know what this type of person is, you have met them and you will recognize them in your life. 1% of the United States population, I think it's a little higher than 1% at this point, but 1%, according to livescience.com, this is not the Bible, this is what scientists will tell you. 1% of the United States population is a psychopath. Oh, you're like, what? That means one in 100 people. Do you know 100 people? Many people know 100 people. If you know 100 people, or you've ever met 100 people in your life, you have met a psychopath. Now, what, what, is, this, what is a psychopath? You know, are they, what, they're all serial killers? That's what people will think. But that's not what it is. Here's what a psychopath is according to LiveScience.com. Psychopathy describes a set of personality traits and behaviors frequently associated with lack of emotional sensitivity and empathy, impulsiveness, superficial charm. Many of these people are very, very charming people. And insensitivity, insensitivity to punishing consequences. Look, if there was, you say, is every psychopath a serial killer? No. And they find that, that a lot of psychopaths, the percentage of people, that the percentage of psychopaths rises significantly when you get up like in high levels of executive levels of you know, large corporations. I'm not gonna name names or anything, but I mean the point is is that these people are very charming people, and the reason that they can rise to power so quickly is because they don't care. There's no rules for them. Think about it. Think about the Christian at work. The Christian at work, you can look at it, if all I care about is climbing the ladder in a corporation, I'm at severe disadvantage as a Christian. Why? Because I mean, I'm to follow the Bible, I'm to, that means I'm going to be ethical, I'm to esteem others better than myself. That means when something great happens or some big project happens, I'm to give the credit to other people. 
I'm to give the credit to the Lord. I'm to give the, you know, I'm just to just treat other people better than I would treat myself. Whereas if, you know, you're this psychopath, you just take credit for everything. You smash other people down all around you. You're very charming about it. People believe you. Man, I've, I've seen this person so many times in my life. But here's the thing. The only reason that that person is not a serial killer, it doesn't go out and murder people, is like self-preservation. That's the only reason. If there was no laws or no consequences, if there was no justice, that person would have no problem doing those things because they don't care about other people. They don't have that, that conscience anymore that, mo that everyone was born with. All right, so look, the only thing holding people like that back is consequences. So no hell would just create more victims, folks. It would create more victims, it, you know, which would show a lack of mercy from God. I mean, so many people, so many people I've run into have this stumbling block of why does God allow bad things to happen? I've knocked on people's door and they've just been like, you know, they don't believe in God because something terrible, one of these, they ran into one of these people and they hurt their family or they hurt someone that they loved. And they're like, why does God allow bad things to happen? Why does God allow these people to exist, these psychopaths? But here's the thing. Turn to Romans chapter 1. It's not his fault that they exist. It is not God's fault that these psychopaths exist. It's not his fault. He did not start it. It is not God's fault that they exist. Look, for these people that, and you will run into these, I've had long conversations with people at the door about this. For these people, hell is necessary. Hell is necessary for them. But look, it is not God's fault. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Let's just look at this real quickly. Romans chapter 1 is talking about people. And it, look, it's not even that these people don't believe in God. They believe in God. They believe in God. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Talking about you know, people that, you know, their conscience just, they killed their conscience, basically. Look what verse 21 says. It says, because that when they knew God, these people knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. These people, they knew God. They, they decided to not acknowledge God. They didn't want to thank God for anything. They became, look, being unthankful is a serious thing in the Bible. And changed the glory of the corruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, and to four-footed four -footed beasts and creeping things. Look, they changed who God was. They started saying God was an idol or God was a, a bird or an animal. And then look at verse 24. And this is where you, what you need to understand. Wherefore, wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart. Because of these things, because that they changed the truth of God into a lie, because they changed who God was, because they turned on God, the Bible says God gave them up. He gave them up. Look at verse 26. And look at verse 25. It says they changed the truth of God into a lie. What, what does Satan do? He, we're going to talk about that tonight, but he takes what God says and he changes it. Yeah. Satan doesn't have his own ideas. He just takes what God says and he just changes it. That's what these people did. They changed what God said. What do the new Bible versions do? They change what God said. They change. Everyone's like, oh, it's the these and the nows. No. They change the gospel. They change the gospel into a lie. They change the gospel to say, it's difficult to get to heaven. What does difficult mean? It means it's hard work. You see what they did there? They added work to salvation, which means what? There will be no salvation for people that believe that. It's, it's wicked as hell. These people changed God. Look at verse 26. For this cause. Because of this. He's saying, they did these things. Why does God create evil? He doesn't create evil people. They turn on, people turn on God. And for this cause, God gave them up. He gave them up. Unto what? Unto vile affections. And now we get into, you know, natural and unnatural things. You see how this happens now. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, like was also the men. 
leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, we see it again right here. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That, that means a, a rejected mind. This means, so when we talk about someone being a reprobate, a sodomite being a reprobate, that means they've been rejected by the Lord. Yeah. That, I mean, that's just what the Bible says. So these psychopaths, it's not God's fault that they exist. It's they turned on the Lord and they were given over to these things. They turned on him. And guess what? He will repay. He will repay. But hell is the tool for this, folks. So it is, it is unmerciful to believe that there's no hell. Because think about even Christ. Even Christ talked about this. Turn to Matthew 18, verse number. I mean, think about somebody who is a victim of a psychopath or a victim of some child molester or something. Just think about the, the horrible, terrible things that these people do. Think about this. But without hell, there, there's no mercy for these people. There's no, there's no, Christ even warned these people. Look at eight, Matthew 18, verse number 6. Christ even warned these people that would do these things. He says, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones? He's talking about the children. He's not saying offend like, you know, like, Speak harshly to them. He's talking about like committing an offense against them. Who would ever com commit an offense against these little ones, these children which believe in me? It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. It doesn't say I'm going to drown him in the depths of the sea. It says it would be better for him. What could be worse? What could be worse than, than having someone literally tie a brick around your neck and throw you in the ocean? What would be worse than that? Hell. That's what will be worse. Hell is necessary for God's mercy. Anybody that commits an offense against a child, look, they've done that because they have a reprobate mind. They're a rejected mind. They're, there's no salvation for that person. That's another stumbling block for people. This is why the, this doctrine in Romans 1 is so important. Because people will say, oh, you know, you, you can just go and just, just like murder a bunch of people and and all this kind of stuff, and, and then just like, you know, say, I believe in Jesus, and then I'll go to heaven. They don't like that. But no, I mean, if somebody goes and does these horrible things, they, have, they, have a, they, they do unnatural things, that, that's a sign that they have a reprobate mind that God's already given them up. And hell is waiting for them. And look, go to Romans 12, 19. It says, dearly, I'll just read it for you. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. And we don't have to avenge ourselves. Because whatever, whatever you could do to someone that hurt you know, uh, someone that you loved. And this is what I, I told a lady at the door one time. She, I, she didn't tell me exactly what happened to her, but I just told her, I was like, whatever you think that you could do on this earth to repay that person that hurt your child or hurt the one that you love, it's like, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to carry that. Because Jesus said, or Paul says, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath which is not your place. It says, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith who? The Lord. What, whatever you could do to someone on this earth is nothing compared to what God has waited for those people. That's why hell is so important. It's, it's mercy. It's, it's, it's justice. And that's why judgment is necessary. But how about this one? Turn to Genesis chapter 6. How about this one? How about this one? Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Does this sound like a society that you would want to live in? As we do this, this thought experiment on what if there was no hell. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse number 4. Genesis chapter 6 is talking about right before the flood. Genesis chapter 6 is when God came and he spoke to Noah about, I'm going to need you to build an ark because I'm wiping this slate clean. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse number 4. It says there were giants in the earth in those days. There were giants, folks. There were giants. Goliath was a giant. Okay, They weren't 450 feet tall. Goliath was about 9 feet tall. You'll find people today that are 7, 8, you know, close to 9 feet tall. 
there were giants in the Bible. They were just large people. There were giants in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were, with old, which were of old men of renown. There's a lot of false doctrine about this one from New Bible Versions too, where like angels came down and like had you half angel, half, you know, and then 400 foot tall people, like weird stuff, okay? It's talking about the sons of God, lowercase s. Guess what? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a son of God. Amen. This is talking about God's people were going in and they were just marrying like the heathen people. They were just marrying heathen people and like these people became very powerful people. That's why it mentions that there were giants. They were very strong, powerful nations and Christians, Christians were intermingling with the heathen, which we know God does not like. Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. The same command is given to us that's given to them. And then look what happened. As they just mixed up and they just married, intermarried, and they became very powerful. It says, you know, they became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. This is back when men, Noah lived to be 950 years old. This is when men lived hundreds of years. Men of renown, they were very powerful. They were very knowledgeable. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord. By the way, repent means to change your mind. It repented. God changed his mind that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. See, the problem here wasn't the power itself. David, King David was powerful. There's many kings in the Old Testament that were powerful. Here's another thing that you'll have if there's no hell. There's no fear of God. The Bible here is saying, like, it was the lack of fear of God. Without God's judgment, there will be no fear of the Lord. And what ensued? Look at verse 11. God didn't destroy the earth because man was environmentally, you know, ruining the planet. I mean, that's what Hollywood will tell you today. It's stupid. Look what it says. He destroyed the earth with the flood because it was what? He said the earth was corrupt before God. Uh, what do you mean? What does that mean, corrupt? Could you be more specific? And then he does. And the earth was filled with violence. Violence is, the inno is innocent people being harmed. That's the definition of violence. And it's funny because when there's no judgment, there's no mercy, there's no justice, there's no fear, you know what you'll have? You'll have no peace. Isn't that what everybody wants? Peace. Isn't that what everybody wants? There'll be no peace with no hell. All you will have is violence everywhere. The whole earth was filled with violence. It says everyone was violent. Imagine that. Imagine Fresno and just every single person except eight people are just violent, filled, and look, they were very powerful. They're very powerful people. You know what you have in a situation like that? You know where you have like a lot of powerful people and they're all violent? You know who gets hurt? The weakest ones. The weakest people. That's why when you get into societies where there's no justice, like we seem to want to move towards, that's why the women and the children suffer first. Because they're the weakest. They're the weakest. I mean, think about a society where there's no justice, no rules, no mercy, no judgment, and I want Brother Victor's car. Or he wants my car. And he's just a little bit stronger than me. He gets my car. And then somebody else wants his two cars, and they're a little bit stronger than him. They get all the cars. This, this, is, what, this is why God flooded the earth right here. Look, folks, here's another one. Here's the last one I'll leave you with. I've got to hurry up here. The Bible says this. I, I listen to like many hour, over hour sermons, so maybe I'm getting, uh, getting I'm just rubbing off on me. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Here's another thing. If there's no damnation, if there's no judgment, guess what? All sin would be equal. What would be, what would be the point of there being, other, that, you know what? That's another thing that's taught in churches today. That all sin is equal. Yeah. All sin's the same. 
Don't judge all sins equal. Are you perfect, brother? Look at Matthew 23, verse 14. Look, this is a terrible heresy today. This all sin is equal. Look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 14. What does it mean if, if all sin is equal? First of all, that doesn't match the law that God wrote in our heart in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15. Does it make sense to you? Would it make sense to anyone in this room if I said that stealing a pencil is the same as killing 20 people? Does that make sense to anybody? Why do people accept this? It makes no sense at all. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach it. In James 2.10... In, well, let's turn to James 2.10 first. Let's just do a little Bible study on this. Let me clear this up if anybody has any confusion on this. Go to James chapter 2 and look at verse number 10. My Bible here is not working for me. Hang on. James chapter 2, look at verse number 10. James chapter 2. This is what people justify. This is what people use to say that all sin is equal. Right here. James 2.10. It says, James chapter 2 and verse number 10. The Bible says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. All sin is equal. That's saying anybody, you know what that's trying to explain to you? What that's saying, does that say, first of all, does it say all sin is equal? I mean, they're just changing what the Bible says. What it says is, if somebody keeps the whole law, because like, say, I mean, isn't it true that some people are probably better than other people? Some people probably have more sin than other people. It says if somebody keeps the whole law, and then they make, they tell one lie. It's like, they're guilty, they're going to hell. They need to be saved. That's what the Bible is saying, because like nobody could do that. Nobody could do that. It didn't say all sin is equal. Look at Matthew 23, 14. I hope you kept your place there. The Bible says, Jesus is yelling at the Pharisees here. And he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore, he's like, because of this, ye shall receive the greater damnation. If all sin is equal, what is he talking about there? He's saying, you're going to get it worse. He's just saying, you're going to suffer more in hell. There's, a, look, there, there's like different levels that people are going to, I don't know what that looks like or what that feels like, and thank God none of us in this room will ever know that. But Jesus is saying, there's a greater damnation. But you know what this is actually used for, this all sin is equal? It's just used by wicked people to justify sin. That's what it's used for. You know, like stealing a pencil is as bad as killing somebody. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, looking at a woman walking by on the sidewalk is, is the same as committing actual adultery. Look, both are bad. Both are sins to lust after, you know, a woman for a man that's married. But the Bible says that, you know, not all sins equal. I mean, women have used that argument to divorce their husbands. Like, oh, he committed adultery at me because he looked at a magazine at the grocery store. Look, he committed, I mean, committing, he committed adultery in his heart. That's true. That's what Jesus was talking about. He should not do those things. We need to guard our eyes, men. But look, all sin is not equal. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. If all sin was equal, why does God have different punishment for different sins? I mean, in the civil law of the Bible, why is there different punishment for different sins? If all sins equal, either have no punishment or just put everyone to death. Whatever. Look at, um, look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 16. The Bible says, if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, meaning that there's a sin that doesn't deserve death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for that sin not unto death. And then look at this. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So the Bible here is telling us that there's a sin not unto death, and that there's the sin unto death. The Bible, puts, the Bible puts the death penalty on a lot of things, on adultery, on men stealing. That's why the slavery of you know, the 17th century in early America, look, those people should have been put to death. They're stealing people. People misused, even back then, they misused the servitude of the Bible, which was a financial repayment for labor, with just stealing people. They just went over these countries and just stole people. They, 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 people deserve death. Adultery, men stealing, sodomy, death penalty. This is what the Bible says. Rape, murder. The NIV says that if, if a woman is raped by someone, that she has to marry them. Hello? Who's reading this? 
Who's reading this garbage? If you know anybody that has an NIV, you tell them to, to just, you know, I'll study through that with you sometime in Deuteronomy 22. It's like, who could follow a religion like that? Get rid of that thing. Throw it in the trash. Get rid of it. Murder, of course, death penalty. Turn to Exodus chapter 22 versus stealing, though. Like, stealing is not the death penalty. And, I mean, this, this punishment for stealing actually makes more sense than what we do today, which is nothing, by the way. <laughs> but Exodus chapter 22, look at verse number 1. So what, what am I getting at? That if there was no hell, if there was no judgment, then just everything's the same. All sin and all errors is the same. Look at Exodus chapter 22. That's not what the Bible teaches. Look at verse 1. The Bible says if a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, meaning he doesn't have it anymore, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall be no bloodshed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be bloodshed for him, for he should make full restitution. So the Bible says here, if somebody steals from you in the dark, if somebody breaks into your house in the dark, and you kill them, it's, it's just like fine. Why? Why is the dark matter? Because you couldn't tell what they were really trying to do. Maybe they're trying to kill you or whatever. It was dark. But the Bible says if the sun be risen, it's like he should just pay you back. You shouldn't kill him, okay? If he steals from you. If you have nothing, then what? Here's servitude from the Bible. He shall be sold for his theft. Because you know all these, these bums out here, all these people, you know what they still have? They don't have nothing. When I see a 30-year-old man with two arms and two legs, you know what he's got? He's got his labor. Amen. And these people that stole this, they're like, oh, he has nothing. He has nothing. Look at him, poor, poor guy, he stole. So all these drug addicts are going to steal and all this stuff. No, they can repay. You know how they repay, the Bible would say? With their labor. Yeah. Put them to work. Put them to work. You know what? That would help them. Yep. You know what? That's, that, that would help them. Let's give them more drugs. We've lost our ever-loving minds. We need to get back to the Bible in this country. Now look at this. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So if he didn't sell it and he didn't kill it, he just gives it back and then he gives him another one. Now think about that. Doesn't that make more sense? Let's say, just think, put yourself in this situation. Somebody steals your car. You're like, man, I got one car. It took me five years to pay this thing off. And somebody steals it from you. So we take that person and we put him in prison. It's like, okay, thanks. My car's gone. You know, I mean, what in the world? How's that help me? You know, thanks. I mean, he drove in a ditch and he lit it on fire and I got no car. But he's in prison. Yay! I still don't have a car. The Bible just makes sense. He's like, you know what, that guy, he should give you two cars. What? He doesn't have any money. Make him work for it. Amen. And he works and he goes and he works and he works for two years. He works for five years like I worked. He works for ten years and he buys me two cars. You know, I bet people would steal a lot less stuff. Because, you know, people still have their labor, folks. Even biblical servitude makes perfect sense in the Bible. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. I'll just read it for you. Proverbs 6, 31. We've got to get through this. But if he be found, he shall restore. Talking about if you stole food or some sustenance from somebody, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. It should, he should be able to have to take. If I come into your house and I steal a bunch of your food out of your refrigerator, I need to give you seven times that. And you know where I need to take it from? I need to take it from my house. And if I don't have it, I need to go work for it and get it and pay you back. Look, all sin is equal is just a wicked doctrine just, just but used by wicked people to justify their own wicked sins. That's what it is. You need to fear the person that is telling you, not fear them, but you need to be very suspect of the person that is telling you all sin is equal. No, that's a wicked person. They're trying to justify wicked things. Look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. Just to finish up this all sin is equal. All sin is equal. Revelation 20 verse number 11. All these people are going to be brought out of hell and they're going to stand before Jesus. This is why every knee will bow. Every, every, the moment somebody dies, I don't care the most, the most rabid atheist out there, the moment that they die, they will believe in Jesus. They're going to wake up in hell, and they're going to be like, oh, it was real, it was true. They will believe in Jesus. And after the millennial reign, this is what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 20, and verse number 11, And I saw a great white throne. 
and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. That's Jesus. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. These are the people that are coming out of hell. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Here. You want to believe in works to get you to heaven, you're going to end up in hell. And then you're going to be judged by every... You're going to get what you want. You're going to be judged at the great white throne judgment by your works. It says, they're, which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Meaning, some men were, had way worse works than other men. Hitler and Stalin. Stalin's going to be way below Hitler, by the way. He killed way more people. Tens of millions of more people Stalin killed, the guy that was on our side. The Hitler, they're both burning in the lowest parts of hell. Don't get me wrong. But Stalin was terrible. I don't know why they don't teach more of that in school. Stalin was terrible. He killed tens of millions of his own people before we even started World War II. But not to get into that. But the point is the unsaved will get their wish. They will be judged according to their works. Here's the last thing. I'm going to finish up right here. Here's the last thing that you would there would be nothing. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, I'm sorry. Here's the last thing that there would be that we would not have if there was no hell. And this is the worst one. I save the, the worst one for last. If there was no hell, there would be no salvation. You say, what? Look at verse number 8. You all know it by heart if you're a soul winner. For by grace are ye saved through faith. I make sure that when I'm talking to somebody at the door... When I say, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I said, that means saved from hell. Because guess what? Every single person in this room, even though you're saved, you deserve hell. You deserve hell. If there's no hell, there's no salvation. If there's no hell, there's no Jesus. What did, what did God send his son here for? What, I mean, to save us from what? Save us from nothing? If there's no hell, there's no point. There's no point in God send, sending his own son, in God becoming a man, to be tortured and beaten and, and beaten to the point where you couldn't even tell he was a man anymore. Beaten to that point, hung on the cross, have his soul go to hell, rise again from the dead. Why go through all that drama, pain, and suffering if there's no hell? Look, folks, it makes no sense whatsoever that there would be no hell. And actually, who would want to live in a world where there's no hell? Would you like to live in a world where there's no mercy? Where there's no justice? Where there's no peace? We already get tastes of this. We get tastes of this from the Bible. We get tastes of this in our own nation as we walk away from the Word of God. We get tastes of this. Would you like to just have none of this? No fear of the Lord? No Jesus? Give me a break. It makes no sense. Logically, spiritually, it would be terrible. I mean, you just look around you at all the violence and all the innocence, innocent people being hurt. This is what happens when we walk away from the Word of God. But when people aren't educated on the Bible and educated on how much God's Word makes sense and how much it fits with our heart, and people just say stupid things like, I don't want to, you know, worship a God that would create a hell. It, it's just, they just, this is what happens. So these liberal, happy, clappy churches with the smoke machines and the skinny jeans and the Hawaiian shirts, they're wicked as hell. They're sending people to hell. They're teaching people. I mean, and look, they're, they're, they're causing innocent people to suffer because of this doctrine. I'm glad there's a hell. It's fair. It's merciful. I'm thankful for it. And you know what? We get Jesus. We get Jesus, even though we deserve it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of